here. Good. Ready to roll. Okay. I hereby call the Riverside Board of Zoning Appeals to order. Can I have a roll call, please. Mr. Childers. Here. Mr. Cron. Here. Mr. Poltz. Here. Mr. Schneider. Here. Mr. Timbrook. Here. Okay, we had everybody had a chance to look over the minutes of the last meeting. Any corrections or changes? Uh, no changes. Okay. And I um, do roll call on minutes. I, we need, no, we just need a motion and a second, and then it's an IRNA. Move the minutes be approved. Second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Anyone abstaining? I abstain. Okay, I guess our first case is BZA case 22-0011, <clears throat> dealing with Linden Avenue. Uh, city want to tell us what that is? What's happening? This is a variance request from section 1115.09 G2 to allow an increase in the sign height and an increase in the sign face area. The first variance is for the sign face area. The requirement is 32 square feet. The request is to increase that by four feet. So this is a 12.5% increase. The second variance request is for increase in the sign height. The requirement at the property line is six feet max for that sign height. The request is 23 feet, and that is a 283% increase in the sign height. This is the zoning map. You can see the subject site outlined in blue and it is in the B1 neighborhood business district. Here is the aerial view of the site. Again, it is outlined in blue and the sign will be approximately here. I'll go to the site plan where you can see the sign. It's highlighted in yellow and also this red circle is where the sign is proposed to go. I know you saw some discussions about moving the sign to the rear, but there are some issues with that and I'll show you in the site photos. Um, so they've decided to reduce the original request from 25 feet to 23. And I'll let the applicant speak more to that because of some of the site constraints that are going on here, such as there's a utility easement and some other wires. But again, I'll show you in the site photos. This is the rendering of the sign. That rendering, is that the first one, the second, or the third one? This is just the sign itself, but this shows you the sign height and what it would look like from the side. But that's the, the new one, the second one moved to the front. It'll be the same sign, but it'll be same in the front, okay. but just letting you know this note here, it'll be reduced from this 25 foot to 23. Here is the front of the site. This is off of Linden Avenue, if you're familiar, right next to that former Pizza Hut. So this is where the sign will be. You can kind of see some of the other signs in the area and some of the wires that are going across the property that would make it hard for it to go towards the back. And another view of where the proposed sign is, again, some signs in the area. Another view of where we had discussed with the applicant of putting the sign in the rear, but AES um, had concerns about the sign going so close to um, their wires. Here's the adjacent property to the west. The adjacent property to the east. I'll just give you kind of another view of the signage in the area. The applicant also provided their own images to give you the character of the area signage in their packet. So that was included for you to see. So for the first variance, um, allowing an increase in the maximum sign face, staff finds that it is adequately justified and meets the standard for approval. It does not alter the essential character of that commercial corridor. It is not um, an excessive variance at 12.5%. 
and it meets the spirit and intent behind the zoning code. They're only asking for a variance that meets the minimum needs to identify the site for the first one. Again, that's the maximum sign face area. For the second variance, the variance to allow increase to the maximum sign height, we do find that it is adequately justified to meet the standard of approval with conditions, and those are on page two of your staff report. So our justifications are it does not alter the essential character. There are some site constraints that we showed you with the site photos, and it does meet the spirit and intent behind the zoning code. Here are required actions for both variants one and two. For the first one and for the second one, either you can approve the application that is initially presented, and that's what we recommend for the first one, approve with the conditions as we recommend with the second one, or deny the application or either of the variances. Are there questions for staff? I have a question. Yes. Can you clarify the um, recommended condition um, reducing the height of the of proposed sign by at least three feet is what you put in the packet. Uh, what height does that get us to? That would get us to 22 feet. Okay. Um, we can work with the applicant on that. That's again, a recommended condition. So okay. the BZA does not have to accept that. Sure. Why? Why? Yeah. Why does you, do you not like, accept like why or why did, you, we, why did we pick that height? Yeah, why did you pick 22? Because that's what we could see was about the size of the signs in the area. I'm good. But you, you can hear from the applicant why they picked 23 feet. Good. Thank you. It was 25 first. Yes. And they reduced it to 23. To 23. So you're only talking about for the condition be one, mm -hmm. one more. Mm -hmm. Really? But again, you can speak to the why they went to 23. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions for the Not city? Me. Okay. At 707, we'll call the um, public portion. Do we have anyone here to speak in favor of the application? You want to swear in there? There should be a sheet there for you. Uh, I, Scott Mitchell, affirm the testimony I'm about to give before the Board of Zoning Appeals is correct to the best of my knowledge. Answer any questions or? Well, um, you want to just tell us why you want this height and? Sure. Uh, so the uh, basically what Chipotle wants is just not more than someone else has. This is actually. Can you bring that mic up to you a little bit? Yeah. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're not looking for more than uh, any of the other signs. It's probably about ten feet smaller than in height than, than the other signs, but it's very important to their operations team that they have a tall sign. I don't think we're gonna be able to see it from 35, but uh, you'll get the northbound and the southbound on Woodman with a taller sign. So the originally uh, we looked at it and we wanted to put it in the, in the back uh, at 25 feet and, and get a view from 35. But what we learned from our engineers who had had discussions with, with the utility company is you can't put a tall sign or a tall pole or any tall structure in the back because there's a 15 foot wide uh, utility easement that runs all the way across it. So our thought is we're gonna put it back uh, in the right corner or the left corner, put a you know, a ball or two around it, and that would be great. But you can't do that because, as you know, there's diagonal wires that come across the, the property at an angle. And then there's wires in the back that, that end. And what they explained to us was that's a future utility pole. They may reroute and take it down another direction. So you couldn't have a pole near or interfering with the, the wires of the sign that size. So uh, we, we uh, looked at, you know, there wasn't really any other because of any other location because of the comp, you know, it's, it's a very tight site. And uh, so they were wanting the, the largest sign we could get and their compromise will, 
uh, let's say 23, smaller, probably won't be able to tell the difference. So that's that's the magic behind 23. So that was that was it. Will that one foot difference to make a 22? Will that mean that much to you? I don't think it. I don't think it would. And you, you know, we want to be in compliance with you all. And and if, if it's 22, uh, I'm, I'm speaking for them, and that's that. I'm fine with that. 22. 22. Do you have anything else to tell us? I don't think so. That's it. But if you have any other <clears throat> questions, I appreciate you. When's it going to be up and available to eat? Uh, that if we get what? It could happen before year end. Okay. So Thank you get sir. lucky with weather. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you. So is my wife. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak in favor of the application? Anyone here speak in opposition to the application? Okay. At 7 Eleven, we'll close the public portion. I don't think there's any reason we wouldn't approve both variances. I agree. Without, without conditions. I'm good with it without conditions. Yes. At 23 feet. Mm -hmm. I think they already took that into consideration, the signs in the area. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at. I okay. I guess. Yeah. It, they're trying to put a business in a weird shaped little you know lot on the. <laughs> yeah. They got some demo to do anyway. So, um, so we're all guys for it. We'll just render. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and render our findings. Uh, case 22-0011A, since there's two variances, sign face area. Uh, we find that the Riverside Zoning Ordinance was passed in law after a rigorous procedure was followed. Therefore, we begin our inquiry with the presumption that law should be upheld without a variance, and the burden is on the appellant to show by convincing evidence that the code uh, should be varied regardless of how large or how small it may be. We find that the property in question would yield a reasonable return and that it could be a beneficial use without the variance. We find that the variance for the sign face area is not substantial since the process is 12.5% 12, uh, 12 increase. We find the increase in uh, essential character, um, uh, the neighborhood would not be substantially altered, nor would the adjoining properties be uh, affected. We find that the variance regarded uh, variance in, is required to allow uh, the proposed design. We find that the spirit and intent behind the zoning ordinance would be observed by granting the variance. We take into consideration the city zoning staff recommends granting the variance. We find that the appellant has met the burden of showing that practical difficulties exist for the variance. Therefore, I make a motion to ask whether the applicant has met the burden of proof to sustain his request for a variance. Second. Okay. No roll call. Mr. Childers? Yes. Mr. Timbrook? Yes. Mr. Cron? Yes. Mr. Poltz? Yes. Mr. Schneider? Yes. Okay, that passes. Second part, B, sign height. Uh, you can do that first paragraph, right? Yeah. All right. We found that the property in question would yield a reasonable return and there can be a beneficial use of the property without a variance. We find that the variance for sign height is substantial since the request for 23 feet increase, um, which is a 283 variance. We find the essential character of neighborhood would not be substantially altered, nor would the adjoining property uh, be affected. We found that variance is, is, is required to allow for the proposed sign design. We found the spirit and intent behind his own ordinance would be observed by granting the variance. We also take into consideration that the city's only staff recommends granting the variance. We find that the appellant has met the burden of showing that practical difficulties exist for the variance as requested. Therefore, I make a motion the, to ask whether the applicant has met his burden of proof to sustain his request for the variance. Second. Roll call. 
Mr. Childers? Yes. Mr. Timbrook? Yes. Mr. Cron? Yes. Mr. Pultz? Yes. Mr. Schneider? Yes. Okay, so we're not doing the conditions. Right. No conditions. All right. Very good. Very welcome, sir. And our second case, BZA case 22-0012, uh, dealing with 3225 Valley Pike. The city want to tell us what's happening? Okay. So this is an appeal of an administrative decision regarding a code violation for an unpermitted land use in the B2 zoning district. So this is gonna be the background of the case. Um, gonna get into a little detail here. Staff observed a, what appeared to be a tow truck facility or auto savage yard in April of this year. Our code enforcement officer did his investigation, looked into it, and from what he could tell, um, it appeared to be that use. <clears throat> he did not find any permits from the county or from the city for the use or the business. Um, additionally, after talking with me, he confirmed that that use would not be allowed in the B2 general business district. He sent notice of violation on April 11th of this year, and the applicant um, upon receiving that notice, appealed to the Board of Zoning Appeals um, on the basis of having non-conforming use and that he classified it as his tenant having just personal storage and not the auto salvage or the tow company on the site. So I'm gonna go over some of the zoning maps that were in your packet, but for those at home so they can see as well. Going back to the township days, matter of a township, we found that the site was zoned B3 and B4. There was mixed zoning, but both of those were commercial or business zoning and did not allow the use as well. That would be an industrial use. When the city was founded in 1994, it still had that mixed zoning. And in 2005, the city took on, over, took on a um, area-wide rezoning effort. Um, the zoning department was asked to do that by the city council at the time to identify properties that had that mixed zoning. And this site was identified and was rezoned completely to the B3. Um, after we updated our zoning code, it became, as you we see it now, the B2. Throughout all this time, the auto savage, the tow yard would not have been permitted. Looking at the aerial maps, we can see over time where there was storage and things started to add up vehicles on the property. So this is the 2000 aerial map. 2010, there's just a few vehicles here. You can see some trailers from semis added in 2012. And by 2016, there's a much larger number. These are the site photos from just last week. That was the front of the subject site. You can see some of the items that are stored there and the vehicles, trailers, tires, heavy vehicles, as we would consider them in our code. Some of the adjacent properties are more in the B2 business use, restaurants, um, a car wash that's permitted, um, a gas station that's permitted by right, a school that's across the street, um, so we're going to address that non-conforming use, which is our analysis, in order to be non-conforming, has to meet several criteria. One is, did it exist lawfully at the time? And if so, did it continue to exist? Um, the answer is no. It was zoned, as I said before, B3, B4. And when it was rezoned entirely, it was not, you know, it lost any non-conforming rights should it have but it did not have them. Moving on, our records indicate that 
there was a hobby shop. It was in your packet. You would have seen that application in there. So there was no application or anything for a storage or auto salvage use. And then whether the use was expanded or relocated, it's something we consider in non-conforming cases. And um, as you saw from the images, there did seem to be some expansion. So. so these are your required actions. Of course, consider, do they have non-conforming rights? We went over those questions, but finally determining whether after hearing from the applicant, have they met their burden of proof to sustain their appeal of that zoning violation. And of course, consider our zoning code, the testimony that you hear today and the items in that staff report. Considering everything that you hear, if you grant the appeal, that means that the citation is overturned, but the applicant will still need to apply for all the proper permits for that use. If you deny the appeal, that means you uphold and affirm the zoning violation and that all the unpermitted uses will need to cease those operations. Are there any questions for me? I, I have a few and I, mm -hmm. um, so I spent hours this week looking at our code. And can you tell me what section a towing recovery, wrecking recovery is actually mentioned as a permitted use or a conditional use? Um, that would be an industrial. So it's not listed, but it is an industrial use because it's covered under the heavy vehicles, which is similar to like semis. And that's been an interpretation that we've had for a while. All right. So within the, within the B2, a full service auto repair shop is allowed, correct? Yes, but a semi repair is allowed in industrial which is a heavy vehicle. Okay. So where, just for my own sense, where can I, where can I find that separated out in there? Because I, I just don't see it in our code where it's breaking out the auto repair shops, being able to use, work on a large vehicle, like a small box truck, a, a small tow truck that might not even fit the category of a heavy vehicle. Um, I see nothing in our code about a wrecking service or a towing company. Uh, that's, my first confusion with this case this week, trying to find that in our code. So we have, um, and I can definitely provide that. Stop sharing this. But we have a section where we have the heavy vehicle parking and it is in chapter nine, I believe, um, where it talks about and describes the heavy vehicles. And that's where we pull that from. It's kind of one of these situations where the code, and especially in, in the depths of the zoning code, it's not an exhaustive representation of absolutely every possible use, you know, that, that could conceivably exist under, under the different zoning classifications. But if you look at like the industrial uses, these are things like truck terminals, warehousing, big distribution facilities, machine shops, you know, the, those kind of big uh, industrial sort of uh, activities that rely on, as Naya said, heavy vehicles, which is something we allude to in other parts of the code. So as a result of, in terms of synthesizing and interpreting specific cases, specific uses, we're kind of having to rely on um, the entirety of the code rather than look for the key word, so to speak. Sure. What, what I find most interesting about this is the word, two words together, auto salvage. So where did the code officer determine that this was an auto salvage yard opposed to an automobile repair service shop? Because an auto salvage would be completely different under our code. And across the street, there is an auto repair shop on Harshman. But when you call something an auto salvage, that falls it out of code immediately. Take away the heavy vehicles. But how did he determine it was an auto salvage yard opposed to an auto repair shop? Well, I think that you've got, sorry, I don't want to speak yeah, for you. Go ahead. Okay. No, I, I, I could, we could certainly follow up with him to ask about his specific rationale, but I, I think that in part of what you're looking at is in terms of sort of what you're, what we're seeing in terms of the layout of the site, how things are ordered on the site, what, what's being done on the site in terms of activity, whether there's a storefront, whether there's a window, customer mm -hmm. service desk, 
whether it looks like it's a business operation that's rotating through and repairing vehicles and moving them off the site, or whether it looks like it's a site that's just storing vehicles more akin to a junkyard, that's one of the things that the code officer is looking at when he or she is, is evaluating the site in question. Okay. So I guess I have a, a general question. The, um, the Planning Commission 2004 <laughs> Uh, minutes that you included. Mm -hmm. Can you just give me the brief of why? Was it just the uh, that that's when they combined parcels and whatnot? Yeah, so it gave you um, the background of that rezoning. There was the previous property owner, and you can see him speaking during that transcript. Um, of course, he spoke against the, the rezoning, but he was aware of it, and so was his attorney at the time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, it was, it was a lot of reading, so, so I just want to yeah. establish that. And the um, zoning administrator at the time also explained the reason behind that area-wide rezoning, so that's why it was also included. Yeah. Any questions? No, I don't. Yeah. I think so. I, I don't want to. I don't want to be a dead horse, but I want to make sure that I'm I'm clear on it. Mm -hmm. Take the shop that's across the street, if you're familiar with it, Naya, where Roy's used to be. They, have a, they had a tow truck that would bring cars in and out, in and out. <clears throat> Sometimes they would put the tow truck inside. So if, and if you don't want to answer hypothetical, that's fine. But if this property had just automobiles sitting there because they were being towed in and out, uh, like Josh might've said, and there was no heavy vehicles there, that would be permitted in the B2? <clears throat> With a conditional use, but none of those were ever applied for. Okay, I, I just that's what I want to know if it would be permitted for. So the bigger issue here is the heavy vehicles being parked on the property, and that our zoning officer believes it's auto salvage and not any type of repair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think on some level it's fair it's fair to characterize it in that way. But I, I think so. If we're talking the bigger issues, I think for for and again, not to put words in our uh, code officer's mouth who's not here, but given the facts of the case and what was seen, what we've witnessed, and the history of this parcel and how it's laid out, it does not to it does not appear to be or present itself as a typical auto repair in and out kind of a business. It appears to be a place where large heavy vehicles and automobiles are stored for long periods of time. Maybe some of them are repaired and move on, and maybe some don't, but it's not characterized or it doesn't appear to be a, a typical, you know, uh, auto auto repair kind of a business like a like a quick lube or a, or a Roy's, for example. It just, and the it applicant himself characterized that as storage, which is not permitted. Correct. In the B two. I don't think. Go ahead. Just one more thing. Um. Uh. What what is B four in short? Business. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Four though, there is no four. There is no four. No, not so that, but what was, I'm sorry. Commercial. What was it? Um, what was it back in? Do you know what it was back in 04? Oh, what it, what the yeah. use was? Yeah. Um, in the transcripts, it was described as um, there was something illegal going there. So I do not know what it was in 04. Okay, that's all. Yeah. And plus, as far as this car moving in and out. Every time we saw another picture, it just kept growing. It didn't reduce. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger with more and more vehicles. You know, so they put a fence up. Well, and I think that that's they it, put a fence up. Is it legal? I don't know. You can't see any of the cars, though. I didn't know they were back there till I read this packet. But to the chairman's point, I think that that's this is part of as when we do diligence on these cases, you know, we get direction to go make sure that people are using property parcels the way that the way that they're zoned and um, the way that the city expects based on the way the code is written. Part of our due diligence is to do that homework and to say, did this site always function in this way or have there been material <clears throat> changes? And to the chair's point, I think this is a case where pretty clearly it looks like a storage yard and appears to have grown as a storage yard over the years based on what we've been able to find. Nope, good. Okay. 
where it is. Okay, it's 7.30, Al, public portion, open the public portion. Does anyone here like to speak in favor of the application? That's fine. And I will call witnesses. Uh, I find it very strange that the person giving the citation is not here to be cross-examined, which is allowed in the code on a, on these types of appeals. Yes, sorry. Sorry. There's a um, oath down there to swear in. Oh, the swearing? I'm sorry. Yeah. I, Curtis F. Slayton, affirm that the testimony I'm about to give before the Board of Zoning Appeals was correct to the best of my knowledge. Thank you. Um, I'll make a brief opening statement, then I'll do this. We will show that this has been a personal storage facility since before this town was a city. <clears throat> um, I don't think that's even disputed. Uh, it is not a business. We're not claiming it to be an automobile repair business. It's not being run for payment for storage. It's personal storage. Now, and, and it's also very funny that no one from the city even came and talked to the tenant to ask, what are you doing? Nothing, no, there was no communication whatsoever. And this has been operating in the same manner since the city became a city and there's never been an issue raised, which I find very, very odd. But nonetheless, uh, I believe it is a prior non-conforming use. Storage is allowed in B3. Storage is not really defined as a storage for profit, you know, like a self-storage. It just says storage is allowed in B3. When this area became a city, it was zone B3. It was in compliance before the city. It was in compliance when the city first zoned it. And it's not changed. The current tenant was a subtenant there prior to the city becoming a city. So he'll testify how it's been used continuously since prior to 1996. Um, and with that, you know, it, are there some more cars there? Potentially, yes. It doesn't change the characteristic of what it's being used for. It's like saying, gee, a restaurant does better. Now it's not a restaurant anymore because it's doing more business. It's doing the same thing it's always done. So with that, I would like to call some witnesses. Where would you like the witnesses to testify from? Well, I need to get on the mic, so probably right over there. Okay. <laughs> They'll need a copy of the uh, of the yeah. swearing sheet as well, if you don't mind. I, Mike McMahon, affirm that the testimony I'm about to give before the Board of Zoning Appeals is correct and to the best of my knowledge. Mike, the owner of the property, Domaloo One LLC, is that owned by your father? Yes, it is. And what's your position with the LLC? Property manager. The property that we're talking about tonight at 3225 Valley Pike has been owned by your father, then transferred to his LLC. Since how long did your dad, has your dad owned that property in one form or another? Mid 80s, early 80s. Sir, can you yes. bring that mic closer to you? That's better. I think I can hear you now. Is that any better? Yeah. Okay. okay. When did the property begin being used as a personal storage facility? Was that about 1990? Uh, or 80s? Did you have a tenant named Danny Pitts? Yes, Danny Pitts was there. 1992? No, that's right. Yes, it was about 92. Has the property been used in the same manner continuously since 1992? Yes, it has. Uh, there have been different tenants, have there not? Just, uh, yeah, just this one and, and Lance. And Lance was there in 1992. Right. And that, and Lance became the, the current tenant, prime tenant. Yes. Since, you know, what time? 2000? 2000, probably. Yeah, about eight years. When Remy, Riverside became a city in 1995, was this property zone B3? 
Yes. Was there ever any violations or communications from the city from 1995 up until present concerning any type of violation until this violation was served? No. Thank you. Lance, come up here and say the oath. I, Lance Compton, affirm that the testimony that I am about to give before the Board of Zoning Appeals is correct and to the best of my knowledge. <clears throat> Lance, do you currently lease 3225 Valley Pike? Yes. And when have you leased that since? Uh, I've been there since 92, and I became the primary tenant in 2000. And when you moved in there in 92 with some others, what was the property used for? Storage. Storage of what and for whom? It's just our own personal property, you know, our own vehicles and, and things that we want to have that you can't have, you know, at your house. <laughs> so are you running any type of a business out of there? No. Has the property been used for personal storage continuously since 1992? Yes. The city may seem concerned about tow trucks. There was some mention about tow trucks. Can you explain why any tow trucks could be present at the property? Okay, so a guy that ran tow trucks lived in the trailer park across the street. The city got on him about having the tow trucks over there, and the McMahons wouldn't let him have his tow trucks over there. So he asked me if he could park them over at our place, and he would go back and forth as he would go to his toes. The, toes, the tow trucks, not mine not ours. We were just letting him park them there because he needed a place to park them and he lived across the street in the trailer park. That's literally it. And those tow truck drivers work for a towing company that's yes. located in Fairborn? Yes. So they weren't towing anything from or to your property? No. When the city did a beautification program when the intersection of Valley and Harshman was upgraded, did the city ask you to do anything with the property? Right. They came and asked us about the vehicles and everything, and they were doing a bunch of uh, sewer work, street work. And they asked, they told us some, uh, all the businesses in that area to do a beautification project. So we agreed to paint the building and put up a fence to, so you couldn't see any of our vehicles. And we did all that. And, and again, up until the present violation, has anybody on behalf of the city ever approached you to ask you what was going on there? or indicate any type of violation? No. Thank you. Wait, uh, hold on a second. So this is personal, so there's no business involved, right? Correct. So you guys don't collect any money from any of those vehicles that are parked there? No. Not one dime? No. No, we never have. That's awful generous. <laughs> they're, they're ours. They're not, they don't belong to anybody. The only- They're the, your vehicles? Yeah, well, me and my buddies that are there. So so all the vehicles we see in these pictures belong to you guys. Mm -hmm. And you own the property. Well, you own it or you're a tenant? I'm the tenant. So you're rent, you're renting that space? Correct. And you bring your vehicles in there and they're not charging you. They're just charging you for the whole, the whole of the property. Right. And all the other vehicles, there's no extra vehicles. I could not come over there and for a fee, park a vehicle. No. You let me do it free. Correct. No, I wouldn't let you do it for free. <laughs> I, I misunderstood. No, it, the vehicles belong to us. We don't have like campers and boats and people saying, hey. Well, so you, you don't know, do that? We don't do that. Just no. a tow truck is the only thing you let do it. I was just letting him do it because he I lived understand. across the street and he asked it. to park it there. I, I got right. it. That's, that's but you're not charging the fee? No. Okay. No. We've had, we've had semis and all kinds of companies come to us and ask us to park and they'd pay us and stuff. And, and we were told from the beginning that McMahon's didn't want, you know, anybody in there running the business or okay. charging for storage. Or we've always never done it. Okay. I'm good. Yeah, Wait, else? hold on. Anybody else? Sorry. With the increase of vehicles on the property, how'd the vehicles get there? We bring them there. Oh, no. Are they driven on site or are they towed on site? Driven on. Okay. 
And I saw that there were trailers there, but I didn't quite understand that. How'd they get there? A trailer is pulled by a truck. Okay. So, okay. What, these are all personal trailers is what you're saying? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to figure out how the vehicles got there in the first place. It's, it's hobby stuff like off-roading, racing, Mm -hmm. you know, all the things Mm -hmm. that you, you do with trailers and, and, you know, if you, you take your boat on a trailer, you take your four-wheeler on a trailer, you take your race car on a trailer. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. Good. I got another question now. If you, um, for all those vehicles in there, <clears throat> they're yours, are they all licensed and operable? Yes. All the vehicles we see in that picture, they're all licensed and operable. I could double check, but yes. We actually, you guys came to us one time and, and, um, told us that they all had to be licensed. And so we started licensing them. A lot of them are um, historical vehicles. They're what? Historical vehicles. Most of them have historical tags. Mm-hmm. Okay. One quick question for you. Um, years ago, I was I was on the site and I, I don't remember who I was there with, to be honest with you. And I remember somebody that was renting some space there or occupying that had affiliation with the haunted house down the street. Mm-hmm. Is that still accurate? Yes. Um, and I noticed that a lot of uh, empty semi uh, tra- uh, containers end up down at the haunted house, or those some of the ones that were there on site ended up going down there. Yeah, they're we bought the property down there, so they're there. Okay. They're at the haunted at the Dayton Spring Park. Does the Spring Park have a business address that gets billed? Is that the same as the what the property we're talking about right now? No. Okay. What's the? Is there a different billing address for the Spring Park? Yeah, it's forty forty right way. Okay. That's it. Anybody else? Uh, no, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you. One, one follow-up. All right. In addition to the vehicles they can see from the outside, there's other things of a smaller nature stored inside of personal possessions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's the same you and your buddies. Right. Not for pay. Not for pay. Okay. Thank you. No. I have no further witnesses. Any questions for my witnesses or for me? Okay, thank you very much for your time. Is there anyone else? Well, anyone else here to speak in favor of? Anyone here to speak in opposition to? Nope. 7.42, 7.42, we'll close the public portion of the hearing. Um, you said that they were, Maya. I'm sorry? He, he, he asked that the, what did he say? There was, I should have made a little note. It was a, it was B3. Mm-hmm. So beginning it, it was storage B, is allowed in B3. It was B3 and B4 was the mix. Got that. Mm-hmm. So then it went to B3. Yes. Storage is allowed in B3? No. Well, he made that statement. So there is a copy of it in your back of the mail. Do what? No. I don't think any of that matters, to be honest with you, because they've told us that this is personal storage, so we can't even look at this as a business anyway. It doesn't matter what the business zoning was. If they're not operating a business, am I off base, Naya? Well, I mean, I would ask our attorney that because storage is listed as an industrial <clears throat> use. I mean, if and- they're saying it's personal storage, now it's a matter of whether or not you can keep a semi-trailer on your property, which is against code. If they would have said it was a business, then we have to decide whether it's within the right business district and whether that was correct on the code enforcement. But right now, all we're saying is, does this personal storage fit within this district? And that's really the question, not whether they're operating a correct business because they told us they're not operating any business. I don't know. I would just advise you have to what your role as quasi judicial body is to weigh the credibility of all the evidence presented to you. City staff has presented an investigation that resulted in certain determinations. You're hearing testimony today. You need, your job as a quasi judicial body is to weigh what is credible and make a determination. Well, well, just for first off, I guess I'm I am baffled or confused or not understanding how we got to the staff determination that it was a towing company or uh, auto salvage facility. I think it's what it said in the uh, 
Yeah, this property is currently the site of what appears to be a towing company slash auto salvage ampersand storage facility. That's another word for saying it's just it's a, it's storage, right? Yeah. It's it's exactly what I think we heard testimony about, which is this is a location where vehicles are being stored, and so that's just the terminology that we used in the in the notice. But it, the notice is just pointing out that that's the activity that's occurring on the site. <clears throat> Jim, pull that mic a little bit closer to you. If, if if this is all personal, there's no money involved. There's no business here. Does that change anything that we've got in front of us? The zoning administrator has spelled out what's a permitted use versus what would be a non-conforming use. So just by the nature of the storage, um, the zoning administrator has presented the code sections that would not permit that as a use, whether you're going by the current zoning or by the zoning that previously existed on the property. Um, Ms. Holt could follow up with that, but the code has been presented to you to show what is a permitted use and, and what is not a permitted use in this type of a district. And the determination has been made that even if it is storage, that is not a permitted use and particularly without going through the proper permitting channels, even if it were a permitted use. But does that, does the fact that money is not taken, it's all their own property, does that have a play in this? No. I, I, I think it does, Chuck. And I'm, I just, if, if he could, in my opinion, part of what the city's argument was is that they never had a, a use permit. They never found an occupancy permit. But if you're simply renting a, a warehouse, not operating a business out of it, you don't need those. It, and now you can correct me if I'm wrong, right? If I, go, if I go rent a garage from my buddy and I'm not running a business, I don't have to come to the city and file for a occupancy use permit for that garage. So we would still like I, I, one example that comes to mind is all like the houses that were built in Brantwood. Each of them had to get their own occupancy permits. I, no, I understand that. But let's say there's a garage that's been around for decades and decades. If if I now go to my buddy and I'm like, hey man, can I use your garage to, you know, store some of my stuff? I don't have to come back to the city and get another occupancy permit. Well, I mean, maybe another parallel is like whenever a restaurant changes hands, we force the new owner to come get an occupancy saying that they're going to use it as a restaurant. But they're that, operating a business, right? Correct. But what I, but I guess what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting is that I don't, I don't exactly see what you're saying, because on some level, even if the property changes ownership, if you intend to use that property at all in any capacity, we would still require some sort of occupancy certification, unless I'm speaking that, out of turn. That, the permit is for... The city say yes, you are using this for the correct land use. Right. If the use changed between two people, then you would have to come back in. If the use doesn't change, and I think we've heard testimony that it's been the same owner for years and years and years, and the use has never changed, right? So if that use never changes, change. you don't. It's it's not just use; it's ownership. Yeah. Okay, use ownership. We have testimony and per, fairly reliable, in my opinion, since '92, right? So since '92, if it's been the same tenant or combination of the same tenant and they haven't changed ownership, they haven't changed tenancy, and they haven't started a new business, my understanding would be they wouldn't have to come back in for a use permit. I'm trying to understand where I'm wrong. I just, I just yeah. keep coming back to that. They're, well, if, if their testimony is accurate, they're not running a business, there would have been no need to come in like this state's in here. And I'll tell you where I'm going with that here in a second. But tell me if I'm missing a, a point here. Where we're coming from, the city is the use was never permitted in the first place. Right. It really doesn't. On some level, I, I kind of understand where you're where you're coming from. But if but if what we're what we are saying is that nothing in any prior code permitted storage at all, ever, and so it doesn't. On some level, it doesn't really matter. Just just because the it was storage was never permitted under any of the zonings this parcel's ever undertaken. So whether there was transfer of ownership or a business or not. Storage was never a permitted use under B3, under B4, under the consolidated zoning. When we revisited zoning in 2004, 2005, it's never been a permitted activity on this site. So Can there you... was a, a case where um, a resident sold off a house but kept the garage. Mm -hmm. And um, now they've kind of put themselves in a box because if they wanted to use that garage for storage, that becomes the primary use. And now they can no longer do that in the residential zoning mm -hmm. district because... I'm bringing that up because storage is the primary use. 
in this business district, storage is not permitted. Yes, it's personal yeah. use, but the primary use of storage is not permitted in that zoning district. And never was. And never was. Correct. Excuse me. Public hearing is closed, sir. Sir, we have a right to appeal and be, you guys are discussing and making all these claims and we don't have a chance to rebut. There is no testimony that's been put on that I can cross-examine. And I'm going to make that for the record because we're taking this on to the common police court if it's not right. What you guys are missing here, there's been no testimony of what the zoning was before this was a city. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you may your, have to do your that. own rules, sir, said I have a right to cross examine. But during the public portion, the public portion is done. But they're giving testimony. They're asking questions. No, the staff is giving testimony, claiming this was never zoned to allow storage. How can the city of Riverside speak to what the zoning was before it was the city? I'm sorry. Forgot. It was that's not okay. I, I'm making that for the record okay. that I've been not allowed to cross examine staff who are making factual allegations that I am not allowed to cross examine. Okay. Here, I'll close up real quick, Chuck, with my thoughts. Here's, here's mine on the decision. I think the city issued this violation believing that it was a business as an auto salvage and a storage facility operating for business. I, I, I believe in all my years that I've lived there, including the trailer port across the street, I've always seen cars stored there for as long as I can remember. So I know that that's accurate, that that's been happening there. <clears throat> I don't believe the definition of storage is for your personal property. I think when we write a code violation like this and it says storage facility, to me, storage facility means that it's a, a for-profit storage facility when you classify it in a business district. So I think that this property is in violation of our zoning code, because no matter what it is, you're not allowed the semi-trailers, you're not allowed the heavy um, equipment, you're not allowed the heavy trucks. I think it's in violation, but I don't think this was the accurate way to address that. And I haven't seen any evidence from the zoning officer that he's conducted any investigation to determine if there was any business in, in this facility. And if that's the case, we can't possibly say that his code violation that he wrote for this being an auto salvage and storage facility is accurate. So I would be in, in favor of the defendant, not that they're not in violation of some type of code, but the violation is not this code, unless there was some other evidence to show they're operating a business. That's my opinion. Okay. No, I mean, I think, it, I think the city's saying that they were in violation of the previous code to begin with, right? Is there any way that I'm tempted to take all this in, under consideration and reconsider it a different time and maybe get the zoning enforcement officer in here who wrote all this? How do I do that? I think, Chair, this has been done in the past where the board has made a motion to table until the next public hearing. Um, the testimony has been closed, but you can either reopen it um, in order to obtain, you know, induce more testimony or take the matter under advisement and table a determination, you know, an adjudication until the next hearing in July. It would be, would be done by motion. Okay. Yeah. And then we get, what's his name? Rob. Rob Mr. Lunsford. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Cause I'm not comfortable with as a chairman, I'm not comfortable. I would probably at this point go with the, the, the applicant. Well, I think, I, I think, think he should that, be here. Huh? I think Mr. Lunsford should be here. I think here. he should be to too. And I think we need to set some kind of forum where if we're making all these explanations, uh, I'm not totally in disagreement with the attorney that he should be able to ask questions about how, why are you saying that? Where's it coming from? That's just my opinion. I think that would be valuable testimony for the board to hear. I would make the motion to table BZA case 22-0012. What's second? You got a second? Yeah. Roll call. Mr. Foltz? Yes. Mr. Cron? Yes. Mr. Schneider? Yes. Mr. Timbrook? No. Mr. Childers? Yes. Okay. So it's table and we'll come back and put some, get a little bit more stuff in here that we can understand some of the stuff. 
to be clear, so what will happen is you is it the board's intention then to reopen testimony the next time we come back so that we can ask the zoning or excuse me the code enforcement officer questions, correct? Okay, I, I think you should be here. Perfect. No, we can do that. We can arrange for that. You know, mm -hmm. we can make that happen. All right. What about what Todd just mentioned though? Um, the title of this, the current use as auto salvage and storage. Um, would that be corrected or well, accurately reflect what we think is going on until we get more uh, facts and evidence? Well, I, I don't think that would change between now and then the next meeting. Do you mean the title of the case? Yeah. No. I, I, well, I, yeah, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that we would need to read title okay. of the case just All based right. on the activity that's happened tonight. But I got it. No, we get a clarification on business versus right. personal versus, you know, some of the other stuff. What's actually allowed. And yeah, what we, is not allowed we can be prepared code. to revisit all that yeah. Yeah. and clarify I think that. That would be important because mm -hmm. they got a lot of investment there, you know, to just shut them all down. If we don't even understand what we're trying to shut down or keep going. Sure. Make sense? Yeah. Right. No, we'll be ready. Clarification is procedure based on your motion. There will be testimony taken then again at the next hearing. Yes. Okay. Will I be permitted to cross examine staff who has testified out of the public portion comment and obviously is presenting facts as a claimant to this board? Do I have a right to, re don't, don't I have a right to cross examine them? I personally don't think of any reason why you cannot. Is there any reason why you cannot? If there's a reopening of the public hearing and new witnesses can be called by any party, including the applicant. So he can cross-examine statements from the city? If they testify, yes. They have already testified. Sir, that was not the public hearing. That was deliberation between the board and the right. city staff. When the, when the public portion reopens, if you want to call more witnesses, you're able to. If staff wants to call more witnesses, they're able to as well, sir. Okay, I'll Thank call you. them once upon cross-examination then. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify so we'll know what we're doing the next time. Okay. I guess we're at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see any other cases. Nope. Oh. Zone administrator, any discussion topics? Just that you have a, a handbook. New book. New you book. have a handbook. It has your bylaws. Um, it goes into the roles and responsibilities of the BZA. Um, there's some articles in there that you have seen before, but now you have a hard copy. Um, it goes into ethics, so that is yours. Okay. Did you make this? I did. It looks nice. Thank you. She's so organized. Okay. So um, is that it? You need you? Okay. Right. Unless there's anything from as by the board that you wanted to bring for it. Oh, no, I don't have anything. Okay. Make a motion. To I move that we adjourn. Second. That's all in yeah, favor. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.